Thank you to everyone who has joined us this morning. Um, so you are on a webinar that is for all admitted and incoming students for both summer and fall of 22. Um, and this is for both the management science and supply chain management programs. So we have um, honestly the presentation today isn't too long. I have some really important things you should know about registration and just figuring out your course schedule, but I think we are going to allow a good bit of time for Q&A at the end. Um, you will all be receiving this PowerPoint at the end of today's presentation. Um, so if you don't have time to take notes on anything, that is totally fine because you will get this PowerPoint afterwards. So I'll start with introducing myself. Um, I've probably talked to many of you, but my name is Michelle. I am the academic support coordinator for both of our master's programs, and I am also joined by Dr. Whittefield today. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Sorry about not being on camera. I'm very sick today and I'm not going to be saying a whole lot, but yeah. Uh, my name is Dr. David Whittefield. I'm the program director for the Master's of Science Supply Chain Manager Program and uh, the assistant dean for master's programs here at, at, at Jindal. So glad to see everybody on here and uh, really hoping I feel much better tomorrow. But uh, thank you guys for joining Michelle and I. This is very important because it's really going to help you guys navigate how to enroll in the courses, get the, the sections and the professors and times that you guys need. So uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, and just to confirm, can you all see the PowerPoint that I have up? OK, thanks, Emily. <laughs> all right, so let's get started. So who should you talk to? Um, I first want to start off by differentiating between myself and Dr. Whittefield and the JSOM graduate advising department because those often get confused. So Dr. Whittefield and myself are not academic advisors. If someone refers you to see your academic advisor, that means you should seek out someone on the JSOM grad advising team. So what JSOM advising can assist you with, account holds. Uh, currently, all of you should probably have holds on your account that involve um, completing a TB test, submitting official documents, things along those lines. If you see any of those, um, you want to contact the office that is listed on those holds on your account. So for example, all of you will have the cannot register online, see the department hold. The JSOM Grad Advising Office will help you resolve that. All you have to do is send them an email and they will help take that off of your account. Um, learning how to register for classes. JSOM Grad Advising manages wait lists, uh, course registration, understanding your GPA, changing your major, and applying for graduation. So these are all things primarily handled by our JSOM Grad Advising Office. Um, you can talk to myself and Dr. Whittefield or uh, Dr. Junkie if you're in the Management Science program um, about any of the following things under the program staff heading. So if you want to know more about how to pick specific classes based on your interests, um, understanding concentrations or tracks, how to find internships and report them, elective course guidance, obtaining a mentor, these are all things that we can help with. So. To recap, JSAM Advising is going to be helping you with physically registering for classes, getting on wait lists, uh, removing holds, while Dr. Whittefield and Dr. Jonke and myself are more of a planning resource to help you pick out and select classes. So I want to bring up Coursebook. As new students, you might not know what Coursebook is. I would say it's incredibly important that you all become very familiar with Coursebook. So what this is, is the online schedule. Um, if you go to this web link we have here, you will see the online schedules for both summer and fall. Um, so summer schedule came out last week. The fall schedule should be up there now. I believe it went live this morning. So when you look at Coursebook, you can filter um, which semester you want to look at. So it might default to, I think, summer or fall, whichever is the closest upcoming semester. 
So when you go through there, you want to select the appropriate semester you will be registering for. Now I want to go over the course modalities. There are two main types of course modalities you will be looking at when you see courses on Coursebook. So you're looking at traditional and online. A traditional class is exactly how it sounds. You have a classroom and a meeting time. You go there every single week. The online courses are indicated by an OW1 in the section number. And as you'll see in the picture I have here, it will say no meeting room because it is a totally online course. So with the online courses, there's no meeting room and no class time. Those take place entirely on the e-learning platform. So you're required on your own time to complete the assignments that your instructor assigns to you. I need you all to pay attention to the kinds of classes you are registering for. This might seem relatively straightforward. However, I have gotten emails plenty of times a few days before the semester starts of students telling me, when am I getting a meeting room for my class? Not realizing they have signed up for an online only course. If you are a F1 international student, this is incredibly important that you pay attention to this because on an F1 student visa, you are required to take a certain number of hours in a face-to-face -face format. So please pay attention to the time of classes you're registering for. I need everyone to mute themselves to make sure you are muted, please. Okay, thank you. Okay, so please pay attention to the kinds of classes you are registering for. This is also especially important if you are an online only student. Um, if you're an online only student, you cannot be registering for traditional in person classes if you are three hours away in Houston, for example, or it's probably further than that. But so you want to be only registering for OW ones if you're in the online program. Um, you want to avoid OW ones if you are not supposed to be or do not want to be taking online classes. Are there any questions about that right now? OK, I'm sure we'll get to some at the end. OK, so the next couple slides are about physically registering. Um, so all of this information, I'd like to let you know I pulled from either the registrar or the JSOM grad advising office. As we mentioned, they are responsible for helping you physically register for your classes. So for new students, you will attend your orientation. This will usually also be a hold on your account. Um, you have to complete orientation modules. You will meet with your academic advisor. That would be the cannot register with the department holds. So you'll send them an email. And this is the most important. You want to look up your enrollment appointment. As of today, enrollment appointments should be loaded to all student accounts. An enrollment appointment is not a physical or virtual meeting with someone. It simply means the date and time that registration opens for you. So as you can see the description of that here. To locate your enrollment appointment, you will go to your UTD Galaxy account. So and then you'll select the Student Center. From the Student Center, you'll select Manage My Classes. From there, there should be a bar on the side on the left hand side of that screen that says something like enrollment appointment and then you will select the fall 22 semester and it should bring you to a day and time that your classes your class registration period opens up for you so as brand new students um, they will usually start april 4th and as brand new students, you are going to be registering at the tail end of that week because enrollment appointments are assigned based on how many credit hours you have completed. So having had zero credit hours completed, you'll be registering at the end of the week, most likely. Um, we cannot push your registration date up. These are all assigned by the registrar. If you have concerns about that, you will need to contact the registrar directly. But you have until you have from when your enrollment appointment opens until the last day published on the academic calendar to enroll in these courses. We always recommend enrolling as soon as possible um, with so many students trying to get the same classes. If you put it off at all, 
uh, you really risk you know, not being able to get your first choice in classes. So it's always good to have a backup plan. And we do have credit hour limits for how many courses you can enroll in, depending on which semester you're in. So JSOM has a credit limit. It's actually 13 hours for fall or spring. Um, it's that odd number because many of you will probably be taking like four classes and your one credit prerequisite. So you have about four classes you can take in the fall or spring and three classes you can take in the summer. So any of you who are enrolling in summer because that's your entry semester um, know you can only take a maximum of three courses. OK, so let's go over some more registration notes. So you will put courses in your shopping cart in Galaxy. Um, there's actually a how to video of how to physically add these courses to your cart out on the JSOM grad advising web page. So there are how to videos out there, but just putting something in your shopping cart does not mean you are finished. Um, so once you see a green check mark during your enrollment process, that means you have been successfully enrolled in the course you were looking for. There's different functions within the registration module, but you can swap classes. Um, so if you want to change a certain class out for another one, there's a swap feature you can do for that. And this is what I wanted to point out because this question often comes up. If you know you want a specific class, there is a space in the registration portal for you to type in the class number instead of bringing up all let's say OPRE 6301 sections it will bring up the specific one with the day and time you're looking for so what that means is you would not be able to just type in 6301 with OPRE and get the class you're looking for you need to type in the number in this highlighted section here so you'll find that detail in coursebook if you open up class details under the course you're interested in, every single class has a specific course number. So you can type that in to find the exact one you're looking for. Okay, I wanna go over waitlist. Um, as soon as registration gets going, I am then usually bombarded with questions about waitlists for obvious reasons. So let's go over some of the guidelines there. Um, pretty self-explanatory, but you can only be waitlisted for courses within JSOM. Uh, you cannot be waitlisted for courses outside of our school. Your Galaxy account, if you're trying to register for a course, it will show you that it has a waitlist by a yellow triangle. Um, so you can try to register for that. There will usually be a box for you to check off that says add me to waitlist if course is full. So you will check that. If that doesn't work, it usually means either the waitlist is full or the number of students on the waitlist for like your specific program prefix have maxed out that section. So what I mean is sometimes there will be seats saved for different majors. So if enough people from your major have made it onto the waitlist, um, it might be close to your prefix in particular. A waitlist does not guarantee registration. Um, so when you are on the waitlist, you have to wait for everyone who is above you to get into the class before you are able to get into the class. And that happens when either course capacities are raised or people who were in the class decide to drop it. If a spot opens up in this section, the system will automatically try to register you and you'll be sent an email if it is successful. Um, it might not be successful in certain cases, so you cannot be waitlisted for a course that you are already enrolled in. And what I mean by that is everyone here has to take OPRE 6301. It's common for both programs. Let's say you, you are enrolled in a section of OPRE 6301, but you don't like the day and time that it's offered at. So you decide to waitlist for a different section of 6301. If you get to the top of that waitlist, the system will automatically kick you off because you already have that class in your schedule. 
So I just want to make that clear. Um, if there is a certain section you want, it is better to just try and go for that one as opposed to holding a seat in one while trying to get a different section. Um, it physically will not happen. OK, and course late wait lists are available until the date indicated on the academic calendar, which is usually about two days before the semester starts. So if you do not get off the wait list before the semester starts, you're not going to be in that class. All right, that was the bulk of how to get registered and kind of get things going. Now I want to show you both your suggested first semester schedules for management science and supply chain management. Um, keep in mind, these schedules are built based on that 12 credit hour maximum. So if you are joining in the summer, you will probably be looking for two, one, two or three of these courses, not the full list. So for management science, you will all take the MAS 6102 professional development course. This is a one credit hour prerequisite and it should be taken in the first semester unless it is waived. Um, there are certain circumstances in which you can have this course waived. Some of those would be um, several years of US based work experience. If you have done a US based internship before, there is more information on that available, and if anyone is interested, I can get that to you. Management Science, you will also recommended to take OPRE 6301, Statistics and Data Analysis in the first semester. Please pay attention to this note I have here, which is OR OPRE 6359. 6359 is the advanced version of STATS, so it's more or less the same class, but on a higher difficulty level. There is a um, classes later on in the management science degree. If you choose to take those to satisfy your core requirements, um, some of those require advanced stats. So please plan ahead and figure out which courses you want to take down the line because every single semester I have students who did not look ahead and now want to take some of those more advanced courses and I have to tell them no because they didn't take advanced stats. So please pay attention and plan ahead for the courses you want to take. For management science, you're also recommended to take OPRE 6332 in your first semester, which is spreadsheet modeling and analytics. And then you can stop um, here and just select one other elective of your choosing. I don't have specific electives on here for you um, because the management science program allows you to take your electives from any unrestricted prefix in JSON. So what that means is you can take electives from marketing or finance or business analytics. It is basically up to you and your interests to decide what elective you want to add to your schedule. OK. Now we're going to move on to the supply chain management suggested for semester schedules. The same thing as management science, you are recommended to take MAS 6102, OPRE 6301, and again the same note here, if you're going to be interested in taking some advanced analytics courses later on down the line, then you should probably look into taking 6359 instead of basic stats and data analysis. First semester supply chain students, we also recommend you take OPRE 6302 operations management and or any of the following. Purchasing, sourcing and contract management. Or product lifecycle management. Product lifecycle management is pretty popular for first semester students um, because it is quite a manageable elective in conjunction with your um, more technical 6301 and 6302 core courses. OK, I want to take a few minutes and just address my students who are coming in in summer of 22. There's some things you should know, which is you're planning for both summer and fall at the same time. With you, registration happens within the same week. On April 4th, there is summer open enrollment. There are no enrollment appointments for summer registration. 
April 4th through 8th, your fall enrollment appointment will happen during that time. You need to register for summer first, because if you try to register for fall without adding some you know, prerequisites for fall classes into your summer schedule, the system might block you from trying to register for some of those. If you do encounter this error, grad advising, you'll need to contact them as they may need to manually register you for some courses if the system is not recognizing that you will be taking them in the summer. And this kind of goes for everyone, but if you do not register for summer or the semester that you applied for entry for, you essentially forfeit your admission. So if you don't register for the semester you are entering, um, you will have to essentially reapply to join the program. So if you have a summer admission letter, but you decided you don't want to do it in summer, you're just going to join in fall, you need to make sure you contact our grad advising team to defer your admission to fall. OK, I do want to go over internships. Um, basically, none of you at this point will be eligible for internships, but is a very popular subject for us. Um, we get lots of questions about it. So international F1 students, you're eligible to complete an internship after you have completed 18 credit hours of coursework. For domestic students, you can essentially complete an internship at any time, but you can. OK. Hold on, everyone. Um, someone I got a notification. Someone took control of my screen, so if you could please not do that. <laughs> Let me bring that back. OK, everyone can see that again. OK, thank you. Yes, if you could please refrain from exploring teams while we're on, that would be great. <laughs> OK, so as I was saying, domestic students, you can essentially take an internship whenever you want, but you cannot report one for credit until you've completed at least 12 credit hours. Um, so these internship courses are either OPRE or MAS 6009 for zero credit hours or these 6V98 for one to three credit hours. Um, this is especially important for international students. Essentially what you need to know is that you could take up to four internships while you're in the program. So you'll have four opportunities for curricular practical training. You do that. Um, by you would report your first internship for zero credit hours, and then you could take up to three more for one credit hour each. Basically, you are allowed a maximum of three credit hours of internship over the lifetime of the program. So we tend to recommend students start out with reporting their first internship as zero credit hours, as this leaves the door open for you to pursue further internships after that. Um, if you're an international student and you report your first internship for three credit hours, you've maxed out that credit hour limit and you cannot take internships after that point. So to help you get ready for all of these internship opportunities, um, many students in their first semester do attend resume sessions, career fairs, the JSOM CMC has many opportunities for you to connect with employer employers, um, so those are things to look into. But I again just want to make it very clear that as soon as you're in your first semester does not mean you can start looking for internships. So please do not, you know, go interviewing with employers where you know you cannot accept jobs from them um, and do not accept jobs and then ask us to bend the rules for you um, because we're really bound by the immigration laws and the university um, does have to adhere to those. 
And if you're interested in the meantime to see what the students in our programs are doing on their internships, you can put either of the hashtags on the screen into LinkedIn and you'll see the internship stories that they submit as part of their internship courses. OK, so if you're joining us as an F1 student and you have questions about your visa status or the types of courses you need to be enrolled in, questions about your I-20 paperwork, you need to get in touch with our ISSO, which is the International Students and Scholars Office. Um, Dr. Whittefield, Dr. Jonke, and myself, we honestly are not very knowledgeable on the immigration paperwork. Um, so if you have these questions, please get in touch with your immigration advisor. You can send them a message in your iComment portal that can sometimes be faster than emailing them. And again, we cannot advise you on I-20 paperwork or make the process go faster for you. Current processing times for I-20s, as stated on the ISSO website, is about 14 business days. Um, so just to clarify, 14 business days does not include Saturdays and Sundays. So if you say you requested it a week ago, in reality, you requested it five days ago. So just to keep those in mind. And ISSO actually has a whole guide on their website on how to apply for your I-20. So if you do have questions about that, I think that resource is very helpful. Okay, I think we are, I'm on my second to last slide. So as I promised, this wouldn't be too long. I think we'll have about 20, 25 minutes for a Q&A. Reminders. I want you all to have a backup plan for classes. Every single semester, I am contacted by students who are suddenly stressed because they did not get their very first choice for classes. It is always a good idea to have a backup plan. If you're a first semester student, there's a good chance you will not get your first choices, especially if you put off registering and do not register at the time your enrollment appointment opens. Um, a few of the things I'm about to say might seem a little straightforward, but I say them because they have happened before. Please do not make requests to us, such as adding more classes or getting you off a wait list. And I specify these in particular because they're not simple requests and students tend to think they are. Um, adding more classes is actually quite time consuming. We have to find professors, a classroom space, coordinate with other days and times in the schedule. So that's just not something that's really possible. And also getting you off a wait list. The only way we can get you off a wait list like immediately would be to bump you ahead of everyone else on the wait list. Um, and that will not be happening either. As I mentioned earlier, the ways you get off a wait list are class capacities are increased or the people above you slowly filter into the class. Hey, Michelle, if I can make a real quick point about that. I, I also want to mention the wait list. Um, that is completely managed by JSOM Grad Advising. Uh, it's done in a sequential manner, but I will say, particularly since we have new students and returning students, if there's any concern from a graduation standpoint, they're going to take that into consideration as well on how they manage those wait lists. Um, but yeah, we we don't manage it and we can't really uh, do anything about those wait lists. We, we, we're under the same requirements as you guys. Yeah, and that goes great with the next point, which is if you need help physically registering or getting onto a wait list, again, this is handled by advising. So you will want to email them if you for some reason like think you should be able to get on a wait list if it says open and galaxy and everything, but you physically can't get on it. They will help you with that. Um, this is a big one during registration periods. Please allow at least 48 hours before sending another message. Um, as you can probably guess, all offices across the campus are usually inundated with student concerns and messages at this point in time. So it will take us a little bit longer than usual just to get back to you. It is best if you only send your message to the office that it concerns, as this will probably cut down on response time and confusion. Um, so for example, if I'm copied on an email that's meant for ISSO, 
I'm personally not going to respond to that because I physically cannot help with any ISSO related processes. Um, but some other people, if you copy multiple offices, might respond, which kind of muddies up the trail of messages and makes things a little confusing. Um, so try to send it only to the office that it concerns. If you're not sure who to email, you are more than welcome to contact me and I can direct you to the right place, which is probably a better way to go than copying five or six different offices on a single email. So please don't hesitate to message me if you have that question and I'll be able to send you to the right place. And just one quick comment, Michelle, about that. Um, what happens when you guys send it multiple emails to people, those folks that we're working with have limited capacity um, when you have five people sending them different emails on the exact same subject it takes their time away as well the other point i want to make about the reminders is that especially for students who are coming into the program for the first time if you are looking to have course transfers from previous educational programs in there please work with grad advising to get those uh, we call those substitutions uh, or transfers get those done as you're enrolling. Uh, what happens is you may wait until you actually get in the course or you get enrolled into a course back to the waitlist scenario only to say, well, maybe I've taken this course and it'll, I can I can substitute one of my previously taken courses. Please make sure that you're discussing that with the grad advising folks as you're starting to enroll. Um, they're going to help guide you on that. Um, just as Michelle said, we go through a process on each one of those types of requests. It typically takes on average uh, about 10 uh, business days or, or two working weeks to get those approved. And we want to get those done um, as fast as possible because we know you guys are trying to get into classes. But that was the only uh, other reminder I wanted to make, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. OK, my last slide. is not pulling up. Hold on. OK, so if you have a concern or a question, we do ask that you email the respective program inbox. So for supply chain, you will be contacting SCM at utdallas.edu. If you have a question and you are in the management science program, you will contact MSC at utdallas.edu. I do ask that you don't email us directly during this time because it is harder for me to keep track of which program you are in that way if I just get it directly to my email and not the program inbox um, because my advice will change depending on which program you're in. So sometimes this is my fault for not looking it up, but students will email directly and I think I know which program they're in. So I tell them something completely wrong because they're actually in like management science, but I thought they were in supply chain. So please just email the um, program inboxes. It helps me figure out how I'm going to like respond to you that way. We will be monitoring these inboxes during this time, usually more frequently than my personal email. So honestly, I'll probably respond to you faster if you email one of these. And I think that was my last bit of the spiel. So. I think the Q&A might be um, a lot since we have many people on this call. So what I'd like to do is you can either put them in the chat or if you have a Q&A, we would ask that you use the raise your hand feature um, so we can call on you all. OK, well, I'm going to just go ahead and start with the few I see in the chat here. Um, so someone says, when are we eligible to start registering for our classes? So as I mentioned earlier, you need to go locate your enrollment appointment. Um, I'm assuming you're probably joining for fall. So to find your enrollment appointment, you want to log into your Galaxy account. You go to the student center and manage your classes and then there will be a sidebar where you can find it says enrollment appointment and then you'll select fall 22 and on the next page it'll tell you the day and time that you're able to register. So I can't actually tell you when you can register. You have to look it up yourself in your Galaxy account. 
Um, can you tell us about co-ops? So internships or co-ops, you're able to do those. UTD does not offer co-ops, but students who receive co-ops, we will approve those um, as the internship. Did you have anything else additional to add about that, David? No? Okay. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, what was that, Michelle? I'm, I, like I said, I'm not with it today. So what would you it's say? It's okay. Did you have anything else to add about co-ops? No, no. I, I think there's a, a misconception, even with myself and, and, and a learning uh, about the co-ops. Um, you will get an employer who may offer you a co-op, um, as Michelle was just talking about. We do handle those, but there has to be uh, it has to be done in in successive semesters and um, that's really the big thing I wanted to make because um, we, we just handle it a little bit differently and that's really an ISSO requirement as well as a JSON requirement. Um, but no, I think that that's a big thing. I know even Michelle this past week you helped me to understand a little bit better about the co-ops and how we handle those. So um, just keep those in mind. Reach out to Michelle and or your program director if you're an SCM. Reach out to me uh, and we'll get you the, the information. That was it. Cool. Um, who should I contact as my advisor? You will use the general JSON grad advising email. Let me pull that. So you can contact JSON grad advising at utdallas.edu and they essentially look at your message and determine who you need to get in touch with. So you'll send it to the general email and then someone will respond to you um, in particular. Should all documents be submitted before we are able to register? So if it is a hold on your count, you should work on submitting your official documents. However, I do believe that the offices are quite open to pushing these holds back so you can register. So if you do have this hold, you can email the office that it's coming from. So when you go into your account and open up a hold, it'll usually populate an email address for you to contact about that hold. So if, you, if it says registrar, you can email the registrar and say, can you please push back my document hold so I can register? And they will usually do that for you. Why will I be able to register for classes before submitting transcripts? So again, if you um, contact the office that has the hold on your account about those official documents, they will usually push it back for you. Let's see. Um, someone has their hand raised. Prabhat, go ahead. Did you not have a question? All right. Let me know if you did. <laughs> OK, what about TA and RA opportunities? Um, so I did not include those in this presentation because as first semester students, you are not eligible. You need to have at least completed one semester, have a UTD GPA of about like 3.8 or above. Um, and have received an A in a class that's similar to the one you would be assisting in. So essentially, um, if you're interested in those, you can simply like Google UTD assistantships or like JSOM assistantships, and there's actually a whole page out there on our website about that, but I didn't really cover it here because you won't be eligible for a little while for those. Regarding advising, I'm not able to book a date with my advisor. So that is quite common right now, considering the schedule just went live. Um, that is why we recommend emailing them directly. If you can't book a date with them, conversing with them over email will be faster for you at this point. I see that I have a hold for a TB test. I contacted the health center and they said that until you get a negative test, um, they cannot clear it. That's correct. I am not. Sorry. So they'll usually push. So 
what this person asking is, will I be late registering for classes if I don't have a negative TB test um, until I arrive? They're arriving in August. So the health center, again, they will usually push the hold back for you. So you can email the health center, inform them that you are planning to take the TB test as soon as you arrive. They will usually push it back so you can register, but it's important to note you physically are not allowed to go to classes until you have a negative test. Um, that is as much as I know of about that hold since it is managed by the Student Health Center. So if you have more questions about that, please make sure you keep in touch with them. Everyone will be receiving a recording of this meeting. It will be sent to you by a link in your email. Can we work on campus or off campus along with our studies? Um, that depends on your visa status. Domestic students have no restrictions on working. If you're an international student, you are usually eligible for on-campus employment during your first semester. I'm unfamiliar about being eligible for off-campus employment. I don't think you're able to, but you would want to confirm that with a immigration advisor. Does the semester credit limit apply to MS MBA students as well? I do not think so. I think the MBA program has their own credit limits that they follow um, because with the MBA program, you just naturally have to take more classes than if you were in the MS degree. So you will want to follow up with your MBA advisor to see what your credit limit is for fall, spring and summer semesters. This Dr. Whittefield dropped the assistantship web page in there for you to review. Will there be an in-person orientation session for the MS SCM program before the fall semester begins? Um, or is it only the online modules you mentioned earlier? So the online modules are linked to like usually a hold on your account, but we do have in-person orientation for both summer and fall. Um, now, I guess that depends on whether you're domestic or international. I think the domestic students, we keep that to a virtual orientation um, because most of our domestic students are working like eight to five. Um, and so then they hop on our orientation at around 6 p.m. in the evening. If you are an F1, I believe we are transitioning to doing those in person. Did I get that right, David? Uh, I'm sorry, I was looking for that uh, gra that question you had on the uh, credits for the MBA program. What, what were you saying? Our domestic students orientation sorry. is virtual and the F1, yeah. we're transitioning to having those in person. Yeah, the, the, the plan at this point right now is to continue with uh, with exactly what you said. We'll have our our international uh student orientation uh being in person uh, at utd and then the domestic students will be uh virtual right now the senior associate dean uh monica powell at that's the plan she has for the fall um doesn't mean that if you're a domestic and you want to attend a, a, an in-person orientation you're certainly more than welcome to do that um you just need to let us know uh, as well as the graduate advising team know that you would like to attend uh, an in-person um, uh, orientation versus the virtual. But yeah, that's, that's those are how they're going to work. Thanks. How can we apply for on-campus jobs? Um, so the on-campus jobs are available through the Office of Student Employment and Dr. Whitfield is doing all the links right now, so I'm sure that will pop up here in a minute. Um, but you would have to go through the Office of Student Employment to essentially see what's available and apply for a job. Hi, I have been offered a scholarship, but it asks to opt for dual degree to take the benefit. Does it mean if I go ahead with only single de degree program, then I will not be provided with the scholarship? So I've learned a little bit more about the scholarship in my last year or so. So you do have to enroll in the dual degree to accept the scholarship, 
but after a certain period of time, you can drop the MBA part um, and you'll still maintain your scholarship. So um, that's as far as I know about that. You will probably want to follow up with our JSOM grad advising office because they help you essentially get your enrollment right to accept the scholarship. So I would recommend either following up with them or directly with the scholarship committee who offered you the scholarship. So please get in touch with them for more clarification on that. Can we take extra credit courses above 36? So as you mentioned, the total for your degree is 36 credit hours. If you take any beyond that, um, that is up to you. But you may have to be applying as like a non degree seeking student to a certain program, depending on what kinds of courses you're looking to take. Um, so essentially, yes, you can take those, but you know, you will have to pay for them. Um, you know, it, it doesn't become free as soon as you finish 36 credit hours, so you will have to pay for extra classes if you want to take them. I also want to add a point here, Michelle. If you're an international student, once you've completed your degree program of 36 credit hours, you cannot enroll in any additional courses. Um, ISSO and DHS requirements are going to have you uh, graduate from that program. So for international students, uh, no, there's there's not a possibility to take uh, over 36 credit hours unless you decide that you're going to do the dual program of both, both the MBA and the MS degree. Um, so what I just put in the chat is the academic calendar for fall 22 because someone asked when will our classes start? So everyone, regardless of what semester you are entering, would be doing me a great favor if you just saved this academic calendar to your desktop or somewhere that's easily accessible because it has every single date you need on it. So it has when the classes begin, um, when the last day for registering is, when wait lists close. It has, if you're going to drop a class, it has the date on there by like what time you need to drop a class to not be financially responsible for it. It has the payment deadlines for the bursar's office. So if you ever have a question about a date, it was going to be on the fall academic calendar. Can I create a Handshake account using my UTD email to search for on-campus employment opportunities? <clears throat> so you should already have a Handshake account if you have a UTD email account. Um, you shouldn't have to create one. So you usually just log in with the same credentials that you use to log into your email. So you should not have to create one. Um, it's already going to be there for you. I don't know if on campus job opportunities are posted to Handshake or not. Again, that's handled by the Office of Student Employment, so you can ask them where they post their jobs. So, Michelle, just because I've had some experience with the student jobs, um, they are getting posted to Handshake. Uh, we in the Dean's Office have had some opportunities for student workers. Um, we Post those out there and that website that I dropped in there will help you guys see where these listings are. But yes, they will be also included in the handshake um, application as well. Um, where can we get the course structure of supply chain? So that is uh, quickly available on the website. I also just dropped the link, but it's the same for both programs. Um, you can for management science and supply chain, you can easily go to the program website. There's a curriculum tab and then under the curriculum tab, you select view degree plan and it shows you all of the core requirements um, and elective requirements for your degree. Do we also get eligible for courses that have a prerequisite of OPRE 6301 if we take this OPRE 6359 if it's the advanced course? Excellent question, actually. Yeah. And yes, um, anything that requires 6301 as a prereq, you will be eligible for if you take 6359. And that is because, as you mentioned, 6359 is more advanced. So if you take 6359, you can take anything that lists 6301 as a prereq as well. 
Yeah, you can. The only thing that I want to add to this point here, Michelle, is that you will need to let advising know that you're going to take the 6359. They'll do the Unfortunately, we've got to go through it one more year and then we're getting our catalogs changed. Um, but um, you'll do a what's called a course substitution form. Those are pretty much automatically um, approved. So as they come through, but yes, uh, particularly for anybody who's planning on taking any of the analytics courses, whether it's in either one of the programs or you're looking at taking some free electives outside of either program, you definitely want to make sure that if you're interested in the, the analytics track, you're going to take that 6359 course because that is the prereq for almost every single course they have. Yeah, and for management science, what I want to say specifically is you have a core requirement in your degree that is business analytics with a certain software. So it's either business analytics with SAS or business analytics with R. If you take 6301, you can only take business analytics with SAS. You cannot take business analytics with R. And this is the issue I run into with a lot of my students. They take 6301 and then they want to take business analytics with R, but we can't let them because they didn't take the prereq of advanced stats. So if you think you're interested in taking business analytics with R, please make sure you take 6359, the advanced stats course. Okay, does the 12 credit hour limit apply to dual program students too? Um, I think we addressed this question already. You'll need to check with your MBA program advisor. I believe MBA students take more than 12 credit hours in a semester, so um, I think they have different rules and regulations for that program. So please check with your advisor on that side. Can we apply for part time jobs before we reach the US? Like once we register for classes. Um, don't think I completely understand the question. Mike, are yeah. you asking about part time jobs on or off campus? I think they're talking about on campus, Michelle, and you have to be enrolled in UTD and in a program before you can apply for those on campus uh, student op employment opportunities. All right, I think our questions are slowing down at this point. Um, do we have any lingering questions? Oh, OK, good question. Where can we find the MAS 6102 waiver requirement form? Let me give you the link. It actually is a online form that you will fill out, but there are certain um, cr criteria for you to be able to waive MAS 6102. So one of them is having at least two plus years of US based work experience. Um, you completed a internship for academic credit that was in the US. You are a UTD alumni that completed um, a business communication or professional development course, or you are a UTD full time MBA cohort student. So if you fall under any of those, you can waive MAS 6102. Oh, another good question. Can you please explain the minimum GPA requirement? What should we aim for to keep our GPA up? So JSOM has a minimum GPA requirement of 3.0. If you fall below 3.0, um, you will be placed on academic probation. However, this should not be cause for panic because you can essentially be on academic probation for three semesters before you are dismissed from the program. So the first semester your GPA is below 3.0 would be considered semester one since your whole semester was under 3.0. And if it is not above a 3.0 by the end of semester three, you would then be dismissed. So aim for a 3.0, but if you're looking to um, apply for scholarships or be an assistant during your time here, you're honestly going to need to have a very high GPA. So if that's something that's in your sights, you would want to aim for about a 3.7, a 3.8 or above. 
Okay, if we were approved for an MAS 6102 waiver for fall 21, but had to defer, do we have to apply for the waiver again? I don't think so. It should still be in your file, um, but you'll want to follow up with the JSOM CMC since they were the office you got the waiver from because um, they'll be the one who approved that for you. So if you can follow up with them, they should be able to confirm. I don't think you would have to, but I am not the person to provide the final decision on that. Does applying for Dean's Excellence Scholarship automatically make you an applicant for other JSON grad scholarships? No, um, each scholarship has its own application. You're not automatically considered for any scholarship, so you do need to apply for those if you want to be considered for them. Can you please explain OPRE MAS 60090 credit hours? So this is a internship course um, for zero credit hours. What those zero credit hours means is that you essentially don't pay any tuition fees for a zero credit hour course. However, it does still fulfill your internship requirement um, because you are completing an internship. We recommend zero credit hours because it does not add any credit hours towards your max allowable internship total. So if you want to pursue more internships after completing a zero credit hour course, you are able to do that. Um, we have someone who has their hand up. If I can inter just interrupt real quick, I just found the policy for JSOM on all graduate programs and dropped the website into the chat. For the question on the MBA programs, uh, JSOM only allows 19 credit hours for fall and spring and then 15 for summer, and that is across all graduate programs. So uh, they, they have the web link to that now. Yes, uh, let's see. Nisha, go ahead. Um, yeah, I just had a small question about the hold. Uh, so if if I have like right now, I have a hold for my transcripts on my uh, official documents to be sent. Uh, so will I not be able to register for classes if those holds are there? Or can I do it? So they might be there, but if you email the office that's requiring of that from you to like ask them to push it back, It'll okay. still show up, but internally, like they will have removed what blocks you from registering. Does that make sense? OK, so basically I can't register without having that hold uh, like postponed. Yeah, so sometimes they automatically do it, but if you get an error and you just email them saying like, can you please push this back so I can register? I I have never seen them not do it, you know? Most of the time they'll push those back because they realize, you know, maybe you're not in the States yet and you can't get certain things done. So they will usually push those like out of the way so you can register. OK, so just in case I can't register, I just uh, shoot them a mail and they'll just yeah. push it back, right? OK, yes. and also just another one. Uh, enrollment appointments is the day that I can start um, enrolling for my classes, right? Or register Correct. for my classes. The day and time. Uh, yeah, so if, okay. for example, it says like April 6 at 9 a.m., you're not going to be able to add classes at like 8.50 a.m. You know, has to be okay. 9 a.m. or later. Okay, okay. That's it. Thank you. Sure. Good questions. Which subjects are compulsory to take in the first semester for supply chain? Um, so before I answer this, I will say, I know we're now at our one hour mark for the meeting. So if any of you need to go off and do other things with your lives, you're more than welcome to leave at this point. But um, I have some extra time to stay here and answer a few more questions. So I'll go ahead and do that. So if any of you are leaving, thank you for joining us. Um, so I'll go back to the first semester slide that I had up here. Um, this is your recommended first semester schedule again for supply chain management. The classes you see above the red font are really what we want you to take in the first semester. Beyond that, it is up to you which electives you want to add to your schedule. 
Can we have a session on all the courses and what we are going to learn? What is the grading system and prerequisites before taking the courses? Um, unfortunately, a beer, I'm going to say that's honestly not very possible to go through every single course in the program, um, mainly because those courses are all taught by different professors and we would just honestly not be able to get all of them on the same call to discuss it for you. But what I do want you to know is that you can go on to UTD Coursebook and if you look up the courses you're interested in, they all have syllabus on there for you to go through those courses and see what they're about. Uh, yes, David. Yeah, I was just going to say that's a great that exactly. If you want to find out what your courses are going to include content wise, if you're looking at see how the classes are laid out, um, you definitely want to use Coursebook. The best way to do this is to go back to look at the previous fall and or the uh, spring uh, 22, uh, if that course was offered in there, and take a look at those uh, syllabi that are out there, and that'll give you an, an understanding of what the class has. You'll also see out there your faculty member's CV. You'll see their, their student evaluation ratings, so you'll see a lot of information about those classes um, that those the syllabus uh, will, will provide you. I can say that uh, for the for the most part, because I do all the scheduling for our, for the OM department for both programs, um, we don't change our faculty members uh, from course to course very much. Um, so you, you should have a very good indication about what a particular class you're interested in is going to um, kind of be composed of uh, to go into it. But that that was it. That's all I want to make a quick question or comment about. Yeah, and I'll also say the grading system, that's a policy that's available to you in the graduate catalog. You can look that up there, as well as um, if you go back to the degree page I linked you to earlier, uh, this will only work if you're on a laptop or a desktop, I should point out. But if you hover over any of the courses that you're interested in, it will bring up a dialog box that tells you also the prerequisites for those courses. So honestly, everything you're asking about here is fully available to you um, online. So I just want you to know that you have all that information available to you. And looks like someone else was referring to the internship requirement. Um, the internship credits are included in your 36 credit hours total. So it's not 36 plus three. Everything is included in your 36 hours. How do we book a slot with you to discuss electives and other academic related questions? Um, so you can email me through one of the program emails if you want to set up a meeting. I will say I do make all my students send me their questions beforehand because sometimes it's not something I can answer. Um, so you can email me with your questions and if it's something that advising is going to handle, you know, I'll let you know if you need to talk to advising or if I'll be able to help you. What is the time that we need to spend for the internship during the entire duration to get to gain credits? So I'm not very interested in the internship, despite no one being eligible to do one soon. Um, the internship, you have to work a minimum of 80 credit hours per credit hour of approval. So if you want at minimum to be approved, you'll need to demonstrate you're working at least 80 hours over the course of the semester. And if you want a full three credit approval, you'll need to work at least 240 or more. Usually this is honestly no problem because our students are <coughs> often offered three or four month internships that work 40 hours a week. Um, Vinyash, go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi Michelle, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to check on the hold for the TB test. I just got an update from the Student Health Center that they mentioned that they were doing for the fall 2020 and spring 21, they were temporarily removing the registrations for, you know, for the classes. But now I've just got an email from them saying that they're not going to be doing that. Um, so uh, what should I be, you know, telling them in order to ensure that because I see that hold on my account and they say that it's for all international students um, that you know you need to get this test only done in in the US. You cannot do it in your home country. 
Um, so won't that be like really late by because they mentioned first week of August is the time they're mentioning that they're going to start giving out the dates for the TB test. Um, so what do you suggest I do in this case? Because won't that be really late? So they sent you an email saying they are not pushing it. Yes, I mean that's what if you if I read. I mean the email that they mentioned is that uh, holes were temporarily removed to allow for fall 2020 and spring 21 registrations. But since we are trending in the right direction and the positive COVID cases, we receive word that we are going back to regular TB testing and holes are no longer being temporarily removed for registration. This is for university requirements. OK, unfortunately, I, there's not much I can do on that since it's their decision and like an entirely different department. Okay. Um, I. I don't I mean, know. But do you have is any? Is this a thing with because it will be a scenario for all international students, right? Because uh, you know whoever comes from outside the U.S., everyone will be having this hold, right, on the account. Yeah, anyone who's from outside the U.S. who has to perform the TB test will have that hold on your account. Yeah. Um, I am surprised that they're not pushing it. David, have you heard anything new about this? I have not. I haven't heard. I don't even have any updates on that yet. So no, I've not heard anything. Yeah, I am sorry that there's not more we can actually do about that. But um, like I said, it's completely managed by the Student Health Center. But we can check into it with our advising team and see if there's, you know, anything they'd be willing to compromise on. Um, but as of right now, I don't have a answer for that. But it is something I can look into. OK, sure. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I saw another hand. Darmanoff. I'm really sorry if I can't say any of these names correctly. Uh, hello, Michelle. Am I audible to you? Yeah, go ahead. What's your question? Yeah, Michelle, uh, I just want to know where do we need to do that TB test? Means actually in our home country or after coming to the US in the month of August? Because it's not possible to do uh, in back in our home country because they are saying that you have to do that test after coming to US. So. Uh, how to do that means I don't know exactly about it. Yeah, you do have to do it in the US. Um, and I think Dr. Whittafield dropped a link in here earlier. I was just saying that I dropped in the, the TB screening processes for UTD out on the chat. So it is out there. It talks about when do you schedule it, what happens from a hold. So it has all the information as well as a uh, listing of contacts uh, in case you have questions to contact the, uh, the, the UTD student health. Uh, team for additional questions. Yeah, the only thing I can say is if the health center is choosing to not push these holds back, um, <clears throat> then honestly, many of our students are in the same situation where there actually probably will be a lot of classes left by the time you register if all international students um, have these holds on their account until about the same time. Um, you might actually still see a lot of seats open until you're able to get that test because many of our students are majority uh, or our programs are majority international. So. What is the difference between MAS 6102 and 6105? I was told I needed to take 6105. Um, if you're told you're taking 6105, that usually means you're in the MBA program. So you would take 6105 instead of 6102. They're basically very similar courses, but 6105 is just used for the MBA program. 